let me start with the backdrop. And so nowadays, there is a vast amount of mathematical material and knowledge out there in the sites exemplified, such as the archive. And a lot of it has not been systematized. And on the other hand, you have this issue of if you're a mathematician, whether you're just a grad student or a seasoned mathematician, the way you get inducted into a field is by either talking to your advisor or a colleague about something, and they will give you a few seminal papers with a few theorems that you need to get started on. And that process can often be tedious and slow, and what we want to do here, one of the goals is to facilitate that so that you are able to retrieve the theorem and de uh, dig into that knowledge base as fast as you can and as easily as you can. So, and to harness that vast amount of knowledge out there, of course, the first step is to try to understand it. And what does it mean to understand a mathematical body of work? You first want to understand the statements, the theorems, and to understand it is to try to parse it first. And that's what we started with. So let's first try some um, parsing. Uh, let's see, it looks a little small, so let me make it bigger. Let's make it a lot bigger. Great, so there are a myriad of challenges here. So first of all, you want to figure out a good way to represent your theorem, your statement. And you want to be specific enough to fully express the diversity and the semantic meaning of a theorem because there's so many of them kinds of statements in mass, yet you want it to be universal enough such that your expression is going to be uniform and encompass all of them, or as many as possible. And luckily, we can take advantage of the full symbolic capabilities of the Wolfram language. Um, and you will see this language we designed uh, in just a moment. And so another challenge is to properly interpret your theorem semantically. And to just get a taste of this problem in, say, English, let's say you want the statement. They ate the pizza with anchovies. So this is how you would naturally interpret it most of the time. However, if you just look at it grammatically, you could very well think that it could mean something like this, right? Who said that you ate the pizza, the anchovies is with the pizza rather than you eating it with anchovies. So, and these problems, of course, can mean just give vastly different parses. And we want to be very careful when we interpret and try to parse the math. And so this is where also you need some domain knowledge in mathematics to be able to do the parsing. Because we actually analyzed a lot of the sentence structures and possible parses to really see well, what is the most probable parse? And sometimes it might be different from how someone would say in English. Right, so an analogous statement would be, for example, R, the reals, is an extension of Q, the rationals, in C, the complexes. And in this case, in C, probably a human would think would qual uh, qualify R instead of Q. So, and so another challenge is to come up with a set of mathematical concepts. So there are a set of terms and notions that are being used in the literature, but there isn't actually a collection of words that describe these different kinds of concepts. So we did a vast uh, amount of frequency analysis based on, say, frequency of a particular term or concept occurring in a mathematical text versus a general English text in English or, uh, well, in just, say, newspapers. And based on these frequency analysis, we were able to create a set of terms that describe concepts that are very likely to be just mass concepts. And so what, that's what we use to produce a corpus of terms that are not just singleton words, but also bigrams and threegrams and so forth. 
And we also want to incorporate a set of fault tolerance. And by that we mean, what if we didn't happen to make this concept in our vocabulary and someone introduces a new concept? What do we do? So we want to be able to make the system extensible and for it to encompass new terms as well. So I'll show some of this. And there's no point in me talking about it. OK, let me not give that away. OK, so let's begin as a very simple example. A field is a ring, so this is a fact. And so we want to parse this. And the structure that we created for this one, as you can see, is it has a head of sentence. And then this is a statement. And this has a carnality, A. So in math, this is actually quite real important, whether you say a or the, it might infer uniqueness and so forth. And so this is object, this concept with type field, and this has property is ring. And so this is the structure that we created. And uh, to visualize this, um, this is the way that um, you can see the tree is being built. And so, okay. and here you have this tree denoting this mass object just for more easier visualization, and this apple denoting a particular property. And in this, in this case, is ring is a property of the concept field. And we designed it such that there are several different kinds of possible sentence structures. For example, for all, and there exists essentially these different structures. And for this one, this is a parse. And then we have, it can recognize the existence statement. And here you have the universal covering, which is a two gram. It's a concept in our corpus that was created based on the frequency analysis we did earlier and uh, with the carnality A. So that's how we represent this. So let's now have some fun by gradually building up a tree and just see how the parser creates a full tree. So let's start with the simplest structure. Suppose I just want, so the sequence is a resolution. And so this is what the parser is bigger first comes up with. And you can see this is pretty similar to what we just saw. You have a statement and you have this has properties and you have this object with some qualifiers and then the property it has. And now let's try to make this uh, more extensible. So now let's say admissible. Now you can see that the qualifier gets popped in. And if I say suppose that. Now this has a hypothesis head attached to it. So it's recognizing that this is a hypothesis. And say of length n. So here you can see that the qualifiers has changed and you have this resolution of length n. And so next say of the projection p0. So this is one tricky part that we saw earlier with the anchovies example in that the off the projection could very well mean projection of links or projection of resolution. But in this case, it's much more likely that this is going to be modifying the resolution rather than the links. Whereas if you supposedly change this and say where n is greater than 1, so here, then n is greater than 1 is going to be modifying links. So there are some subtleties that we do have to take into account and uh, build that into the parser. Wait, yeah, so this is a finished tree. And there are also other kinds of structures, such as the ones with both hypotheses and statements and so forth. Right, so this is more example. Right, so earlier I did say that our parser is supposed to be fault tolerant. And let's try something that's perhaps more fun. And I totally did not come up with this before, except I did. Um, say grow. These words are not in my vocabulary. Um, 
in California. These are true as far as I know. Sorry, I didn't capitalize it. So you can see here that uh, this did correctly pick up the correct structure. And so the parser has some bootstrapping built in uh, based on certain words it does know and um, what possible things uh, parses uh, could result. Right, and of course you can change it and it will be uh, similarly compatible. So, right, so, yeah. What would happen if you said suppose that? Ah, okay, suppose that. Now the chance of public can embarrass myself in public. Oh, it did pick up the hypothesis. Yeah, so it should, okay. yes. Anything else? Oh, yes. Right. Is a logical conjunction meaning that both of those have to be satisfied, or does it mean uh, a conjunction meaning a list of two entities? Right. So in this case, right, it's a list in this case, right. And in particular, as you see here, we don't have booleans, and um, and that's actually exactly the reason why I use lowercase c rather than uppercase c. Right, so that Mathematica, uh, the Wolfram language, will not think of it as the logical conjunction. But yeah, that's absolutely right. Great, we can have some more fun with it later if you'd like. And just a few more words um, on the implementation. So this is a bottom-up parser that relies on context-free grammars, and we produce a set of competing parses to and then rank them. And the one you see is the highest rank one. And the ranking is actually quite tricky because you want to make sure to take into account things like we discussed earlier about how prepositions are associated to entities and so forth. Right, okay. So, and then these points we discussed earlier. Right, great. So now let's talk about how we might be using the parse. So now that we have a chance to get to know a theorem, let's see how we can harness the structure that we created from the theorem using the parse. So a search would of course be very useful for uh, various things. So maybe I should just cut to the chase in the interest of time and um, show you some examples rather than bring you through the bullet points. And then I should go through the same thing and exit for maybe this will okay. Oh. So this is, so we build an end-to-end -end system where you can um, you have this web interface and access and search the database that we created. So the database here is uh, papers that we scrape from archive. So there are over a million papers all total and out of them about 300,000 mathematical physics and math papers from which we extracted theorems from. And there was a, a pretty elaborate process of extraction and LaTeX processing and so forth. And so the goal of this is not so much of a general search engine, simply because we are basing our database from, say, archive, which are the latest cutting edge technology and, well, rather mass research. And so you have here rather very specialized and esoteric kind of theorems. But it is good if you have specific search terms and you want to find the latest results on a particular concept. So for example, you're not going to find much on say group because group is a very general concept that people have known for hundreds of years, but there might be more on say finite simple group. And um, so this interface, here are going to be some results here containing this. And you will note that for some of these, we have two parts in our result. One is the actual theorem itself that we extracted from the various papers, and then the contextual aspect, meaning many papers that we see are actually just snippets containing symbols that were defined elsewhere in the text. And of course, it's not useful for you to just look at the symbols without knowing the context. So we actually went and extracted these possible definitions of concepts and symbols that occur elsewhere earlier in the paper uh, and to display it for you. And suppose you want to actually 
look at a paper, you can go right away to the archive link and dig on it further. So, um, okay, so without further ado, um, so we can, so here I brought it up earlier. So one distinguishing feature from, of this particular search versus say the more general Google Scholar <clears throat> or Wikipedia or Microsoft academic search is we look specifically in a particular theorem instead of throughout the text and we semantically parse it so that we try to get the result that's faithfully, semantically faithful as possible to the input. And so for example, let's try something like closure of a subgroup <coughs> of abelian variety. And so you know, oh, what do I have here? Abelian varieties are naturally, their varieties equipped with a group structure and, okay, so I'm on VPN, so it seems a lot slower than what I was experiencing earlier. Um, so, and with a group structure, it actually, is it not on? Okay, maybe I should have you use that. Ah, there we go. So, and you see that the first result brings up this particular, well, in particular, Mazur's conjecture for abelian varieties that tells you about the closure of a subgroup of abelian variety. And this is using what you are inputting here, the closure of subgroup, and trying to see that the closure is a modifier of subgroup and we want this off the abelian variety. So essentially trying to use a parse to interpret it and find the closest uh, match. And in comparison, you have something, say a Google Scholar, where you see that a lot of the words are interspersed throughout the text. And so this kind of illustrates the difference between our search and some general search, in that we are more focused, it's within a particular theorem, and we try to make the quantifiers and modifiers in the correct way just the way um, that's re represented in the user input. Right, and just for completeness check, here is the result for uh, uh, Microsoft Academic Search, which is, um, I think, even worse than the Google one. Right, I mean, this is really not to ditch on these products. I just think that they fulfill different purposes and if you want to learn generally about a particular concepts, uh, definitely go for Wikipedia or Google Scholar. But if you have particular things like, say, general fiber is a product of elliptic curves, um, you see that here we basically have results that will uh, try to pull up from these papers what hopefully what you are asking for. Great, so, and there are various examples uh, throughout, but in the interest of time, I think I'll skip some of these. And by some, I mean all of them. Um, right, so actually, let me try this. <clears throat> so, so here is group representations completely reducible and Ideally, you are looking for what are the conditions that will make your group representation completely reducible. And here are some of the top results that say, in fact, any finite dimensional representation is completely reducible of a compact Lie group. And um, you can look at the theorem right away. That's really the essence of a paper. And then, of course, you can just browse through and figure out and see all these other results that um, are all on completely reduced representations of groups. Okay, great. Yeah, feel free to talk to me afterwards about some of these others. And just briefly about the implementation, we, as I said, we did a lot of data processing and in particular extraction of the LaTeX and of course that involves dealing with all the macros and doing all the symbols and so forth to make sure that the theme that we extracted actually is complete. We don't have to rely on all these tech packages to display our results and so forth. 
And then we went through and generated the parses of all of the theorems that we extracted, and also along with metadata such as, uh, say, the authors, title, and dates, and so forth of publication. And we then use the parser's theorem to try to uh, find the closest results, as well as a word matching if supposedly the parse uh, doesn't somehow apply. And so, and this again is based on a set of word frequency analysis of what are the most important words. And we also use synonyms and antonyms and related words to figure out, well, maybe we have a result not exactly what you want, but something that's related phrased slightly differently. And so we have a various uh, search techniques, and one of which is uh, uh, singular value decomposition that we used for reducing dimensions. And we have the semantic space of around uh, 28,000 words, and then we apply um, just the usual SVD technique that you might know from recommender systems down to 35 dimensions. And that allows us to search for nearest theorems, well, converted to vectors in our case, uh, faster using all built-in mathematical functions. And so, and this is basically one of the uh, search algorithms. And feel free to talk to me later about some of the other things we're doing. So, and lastly, some question for you is, if you were to have a system like this, how would you want us to expose this to the outside and how do you think whether it's through one of our products, say Entity Store or well, from Alpha or a standalone website, let us know. And if you have any suggestions, let us know as well. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank my team without whom this would not be possible. But above all, Jeremy Michelson and Michael Trout. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk very briefly about how we're representing uh, mathematical theorems in the Wolfram language for the purposes of entity stores, uh, general lookup. Um, so entity store is a function that users can use to emulate our general data framework. We've curated thousands of definitions and theorems in pure math, right now focusing on the subjects of topology and algebra and the intersection algebraic topology. So, so some examples, topology concepts, these are things that in a textbook they would appear as a definition. So we got like the definition of the subspace topology, countable bases, etc. And there's quite a lot of these. There's theorems, there's general theorems that don't typically have names, like some theorems about how different bases can have their topologies related, and there's also named theorems like the TT extension theorem. There's also algebra definitions. These are mostly about group theory. There's many of those. Algebra theorems. Some of these names should be cleaned up a little bit, but you can see the kind of coverage that we have. All right. Now, I'll show in a second how we actually represent the definition symbolically, but they start with the uh, logical symbols that we have, and, or, implies, equivalent, uh, subsets, etc. Now, we can already write some mathematical formulas in Mathematica. For example, the statement that the square of any real number is non-negative. Doesn't do anything on its own, but there's functionality to reduce this and do computations with it. So this happens to be a true statement. For set theory, that looks bad. Let me shrink this down. Hopefully you can read these somewhat in the back. Um, we introduced about 50 new symbols, well, are going to introduce several of these for expressing set theory. So if you all want to write a set, you might want to use set builder notation. You can see what the argument structure that we've settled on is for that. Um, probably cannot see the very bottom example. Let's 
So here I've written an example statement that there are no injections from the reals into the integers. So this is what it would look like symbolically, and then in traditional form, this is how you might see it in a textbook. So what are the actual properties of these entities? Well, for concepts, we think of these as functions. So the concept is compact. You think of this as operating on some topological space. It returns, well, it returns whether or not it is compact. So here you see the arguments would be x. The restriction is that x must be a topological space. The output is this complex thing about open covers. Um, Then when we want to represent the application of this concept in a symbolic description, we use the math head. So here we see math of is compact of y. So this would be the symbolic statement that y is a compact topological space. Because these are symbolic, we can use make boxes, rules, and other things to define formatting to make, transform the symbolic structure that you see here for, say, the tube limit into something more like what you would see in a textbook. Um, also, since they're symbolic, we can just use pattern matching, say, look through every theorem, look for the ones that mention the is compact concept. And you can see quite a lot of those. And these are some other properties that supported some metadata type things like references that include page numbers, the references have authors, etc. Here's another example of a uh, theorem. So this is saying that for all x, such that x is a topological space, that this condition holds. You're metrizable if and only if you're regular and have a sigma locally finite base. So this is all being shown in the summary grid property. There's also this property relations for certain theorems that this is essentially an ontological statement about classes of topological spaces. If you are a metrizable space, then you are also in the class of regular spaces and in the class of sigma locally finite spaces and vice versa. Here's an example of some references that you can pull up. So given any entity, you should be able to find the book that it came from, also what page number. The, the references are computable, so these uh, typeset um, citations are being generated computationally. You can see we have ISBN, page count, publisher information, author information. These are aligned with people data in the Wolfram language. And here's all of the sources that we have used so far in curating these concepts and definitions. We also have entities representing particular examples. So we have, con we have definitions, theorems, and then these are like example topological spaces. For example, here's the real numbers. Um, for each of these, we'll have the elements, which says what the underlying set is, which the underlying set for the reals is the reals. And then you can also see the symbolic um, formulation of what the topology is. So the topology is generated by these open intervals. And then all of these ontological classifications, the reals are Lindelof, and they are the reals do form a manifold. With all those properties, you can query things. For example, give me a list of topological spaces that are T1 but are not Hausdorff. Right now, we don't have many, but this list will be expanded. Hope everyone can see that at the bottom. And another thing we can do with those ontological relationships between classes of topological spaces is make sort of a implication diagram. So this is cluttered. Let me look at, say, just the separation properties. Let me shrink this down. OK, so there's some overlap. But you can see things like, is completely normal? That implies normal. So this is interactive. If I left click on a node, highlights green, highlights everything green that it can deduce from that. Another thing that you can do is, say, assume that you are T1. Well, this will change. Certain of these properties will now become equivalent. And you can see that computationally this high deduce button. So under the condition that you're T1, we know that is perfectly normal and is perfectly T4 become equivalent because of the property relations that we curated for the various theorems. You can look at cardinality properties. If you have a single point, then you are, of course, finite, and you're not countably infinite. 
And that is all I have to say about that. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what Lean is and what uh, interactive theorem provers are more generally. So uh, an ITP, or proof assistant, is a uh, computer program that's used to verify that uh, mathematical proofs are correct, right? So uh, no ITP that I know of can currently do this with sort of natural language mathematical discourse, right? Say, in the form of a PDF or text sources. So uh, an ITP defines a language, right, that you can use to define mathematical objects, properties, relations, and so forth, in which you can state theorems and formulate proofs of the theorems. ITP will then judge whether the proofs are correct. That is, does the proof show that the theorem follows from the axioms of mathematics and the rules of logic, right? So in principle, an ITP verifies the proof down to the axiom. So the precise choice of foundations, right? So for instance, classical logic and Z ZFC set theory does matter, right? This will make a difference in terms of uh, what you can prove, uh, but that I think I will uh, ignore here. So uh, to prevent the need to actually write out the theorems down to the axioms, an ITP also provides typically a library of definitions and proved theorems that you can reference, right? Uh, and it also typically can fill in some details of a proof which are not specified explicitly, but it can deduce from context. Uh, and in some cases, it may be able to automatically generate proofs or at least uh, parts of proofs, right? So I think to the extent that ITPs are known in the broader mathematical community, it's because they have been used to formalize, formalize and verify some very complex proofs. Uh, notably, the, the four-color theorem, uh, the Feit-Thompson odd order theorem, uh, and the con Kepler conjecture on sphere packing. Right? ITPs are also, however, useful for uh, shorter proofs, um, as sort of reflected in uh, in the theorem libraries that are built up around them. Right? And they have even uh, begun to be used in courses on logic and proof taught sort of at the uh, beginning undergraduate level. All right, so the, uh, the Lean Theorem Prover specifically uh, is an open source uh, prover developed uh, at Microsoft Research. Uh, much of the development on the theorem library at uh, CMU. Uh, it's implemented in C++, uh, highly performant, it's based on dependent type theory, specifically the calculus of inductive constructions, uh, and it is designed to support strong automation. Uh, much of that uh, development of sort of um, automated theorem proving, that is proving uh, complete theorems without assistance from a human is in the future, but uh, at least in some uh, for some classes of theorems, uh, that's already here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to give you a sense of what the, uh, the lean language looks like. So under the Curry-Howard correspondence, the theorem corresponds to a type. Uh, a proof of the theorem is then a term of that type, right? So, so this reduces proof checking uh, essentially to type checking. Right, so, so given that, you may not be too surprised to see that the language uh, that Lean uses to represent proofs looks something like Haskell and similar ML type languages. Um, <clears throat> all right, so proofs can also be specified, right? So here, I mean, in this case, we're actually writing out a uh, term explicitly, right? Uh, but they can also be specified with what we call tactic proofs. Uh, so you specify a, a sequence of tactics, each of which contributes to the construction of the proof term. Uh, and so I'd like to give you a sort of a, a quick idea of what that uh, looks like. Um, 
so, so here um, I can uh, step through the proof. So, so here this, uh, this theorem that I'm looking at is just, uh, it says that if you know P and Q, then you can deduce Q or P, right? It's, it's trivial um, and, uh, right? The point of lean in some sense is that it goes far beyond propositional logic, but um, just for illustration purposes, uh, you can see here that uh, what this tells me is I have some context. Uh, P and Q are propositions, right? And this here after the turnstile symbol is the goal, that's what I want to prove, right? And if I apply the intro tactic, right, that uh, takes the hypothesis of my goal and makes it part of the context. Uh, the cases tactic now splits that, right? So I now have P and Q as separate hypotheses that I can apply. Uh, this, um, this here uh, tells me that, well, if I want to prove Q or P, I may as well just prove P. Right, and the assumption tactic looks to see whether there are any uh, hypotheses that match that. Right, it finds it and tells me there's no goals left. All right, so now I want to talk about sort of uh, the the main event here. So uh, the uh, link between Mathematica and Lean. Uh, here was it was developed by Rob Lewis and uh, Min Chao Wu. Min Chao is here today, and some of you may have seen uh, Rob's talk at last year's conference where he uh, talked about an earlier version of this link. So the link is bidirectional. Uh, you can uh, call Lean from the Wolfram language and vice versa. It allows for arbitrary exchange of information, and it is user extensible. So much of that extension can be done simply by uh, writing down values in the Wolfram language. Uh, so uh, this is all freely available. The code is on GitHub, and uh, if you get the, um, the notebook, you'll find links to uh, instructions for uh, setting up the link. Right, And I should also mention uh, that the link is described in far more detail in uh, a paper uh, by Rob and Min Chao. Um, they go into more detail on the internals of the link, give a longer list of applications, and talk something about the, uh, the history of uh, work in this field. All right, so, so the first direction I want to talk about is calling the Wolfram language from within Lean. So a typical application here is you create a tactic which sends an expression to the Wolfram language for computation. It receives an answer and verifies it and uses the verified answer in the construction of a proof. Um, so there's, in fact, many other ways that you can use the link. Uh, so for instance, you could decide to simply trust anything that Mathematica sends back. You do this by sort of anything you receive from the Wolfram language you turn into an axiom. But that sort of goes against the point of, uh, of theorem provers generally, right? So, uh, but, but this, uh, this um, scenario that, that I outline here is particularly useful when it's easier to verify an answer than it is to find it, right? So this is cases like factoring polynomials, uh, factoring matrices, anti-differentiation, solving differential equations, and so on. Some of these we have actually uh, implemented. So we've created a factor tactic uh, that um, does polynomial factorization. Um, LUTAC does the LU decomposition. Um, and it's also possible to develop tactics that are used sort of in a purely informative role, which is to say, we don't actually use the results that come back from Mathematica in the proof term. Um, so, um, so as an example, we have a sanity check tactic, which you just sort of apply at the beginning of your proof uh, to try to verify that it is not, in fact, uh, false. So I'd like to um, demonstrate 
some of these. So, all right, so let me just show you here what the definition of the factor uh, tactic looks like. Uh, you can see here that um, what it does when it receives an expression is it, it assembles a command to send to the Wolfram language, right? So it does some processing uh, to, to reflect it in the Wolfram language, uh, but ultimately the work is being done by the factor function, right? And then there's some additional processing to use the uh, lean simplifier to verify that that um, it can, in fact, prove what it's getting back from uh, Mathematica. So let me show you an example here. Uh, so here is uh, a proof that x squared minus 2x plus 1 is greater than 0 for all real x. All right. Um, <clears throat> OK, so here's the context. Uh, x is real. We want to show the polynomial is non-negative. When I apply the factor tactic, right, it get, it's, sends the polynomial to Mathematica, gets the factorization back, it verifies the equation, and adds that to the context as a hypothesis available for me to use. Right? Then the rewrite tactic uses that to say, well, to show the polynomial is greater than zero, I may, well, may as well show this, this factored form is, and then uh, it calls a lemma that says in certain contexts uh, squares are all, always non-negative, right? And that completes the proof, right? So here's another example. Maybe this one you can't do in your head, but um, right? So uh, all right. So. So that's the, the factor tactic. Let me just show what, show what I mean by the sanity check tactic. So here's a, a trivial theorem. If x is a, an integer, non-negative, then it's non-negative. All right, so the sanity check uh, tactic here has nothing to say. Go ahead. Uh, here's another example. x is real. Suppose we know that sine of x is 0, uh, then let's and suppose we know that um, cosine of x is positive. Can we show that x is equal to 0? The sanity check um, tactic here complains, right? Because what it's done is it's called find instance on the um, negation of the theorem and has come up with a counterexample. Um, all right, so then if you add an additional hypothesis, right, you have a, a theorem that at least as far as sanity check can tell is not false. And so you can proceed with the proof. All right. All right, so now I want to talk about the, uh, the other direction of the link. Um, actually, I, so this is what I just spoke about. Um, so calling lean from the Wolfram language. All right, so, so here the idea is you send a query from Mathematica to Lean and get a result, typically a proof, back. OK, so um, the link defines this function prove using Lean tactic. It takes a Mathematica expression, right, and the name of a uh, tactic, uh, which is uh, then applied. All right, so this for all typed function this is sort of a, uh, a mild extension of the for all function in uh, Mathematica that takes a lean type. All right, so this is the proof term sort of as you might see it in lean, right? Um, you can also specify that you want to get this as a Wolfram language expression. So this is sort of the low-level representation, contains all the data that's uh, used internally by Lean. Um, and then in some cases, we can do some transformations to th you know, so throw away some of the irrelevant information, uh, at least as far as we're concerned, uh, to get a, uh, a representation that's 
somewhat more readable. Right, so, so lean form is, uh, is one example of, of the types of things that you might want to extend uh, yourself. All right, so now I'll just show a couple of applications, right? So Wolfram Language provides a very nice uh, environment for visualizing proofs. Okay, so uh, the diagram of formula function that, uh, that we put together for this link takes a statement in propositional logic. It sends it to lean for a proof. Now, propositional logic is simple enough that lean can do the proof without any assistance. Uh, it translates... Uh, the proof to a Wolfram language expression, and then uses the, the graph functionality in Mathematica to generate a nat natural deduction diagram. All right. So, and I, I will mention that you know this is currently uh, currently this works for um, for statements that can be proved in the context of intu intuitionistic logic. Uh, a version for classical logic is in development. Okay, so uh, right here's an example of what this does. So here's here's this uh, this theorem we looked at before. If p and q is true, then also q or p, right? So um, I'll try to briefly translate what this says. So here's our hypothesis: uh, p and q. Uh, if you apply an uh, elimination, the and elimination rule, this tells you you know Q, uh, and or introduction gives you Q or P, and then discharging the hypothesis A, you get the implication. All right, so here's another example. Right, so to read this one, uh, it's probably helpful to know that the way that um, lean represents not P is as P implies false. All right, if you know that, you can follow this proof the same way. Okay, and here's another example, uh, right? Um, all right, but uh, so we can go, I think, far beyond this. Um, you can imagine doing this not, not only for proofs in propositional logic, but uh, for first order logic, uh, equational logic and, uh, and so forth. Um, and you can imagine doing things a lot uh, you know, beyond just graph functionality. We have a lot of di dynamic elements. You could uh, uh, add tooltips and other features to be able to drill down into a particularly large and uh, complicated proof. Uh, because you get sort of a complete specification of the proof back from, uh, from Lean, you can do whatever you like. You might imagine, for instance, converting the proof into natural language. Um, so I'll show one more example. This is more of a minimalist example. Rather than trying to return a complete proof, uh, what we do here in the context of set normalization is simply try to give you a sketch of the proof by returning the relevant theorems that Lean used in the proof. Right, so for instance, so here we have a, uh, a set equality, and Lean tells you that what you really need to know is that uh, union uh, is commutative and associative, right? Okay, so I think that's uh, all I have to say about this. I did want to make one sort of final remark, uh, and that is that there are a number of other projects that we are doing related to, to theorems and mathematical knowledge more broadly uh, that we didn't have time to uh, talk about at the conference. But those include things like a collection of mathematical constants, um, uh, additional special functions, uh, coordinate systems, and statements that are equivalent to or otherwise related to the Riemann hypothesis, right, so that we uh, expect to be exposing through the entity value framework in the near future. So uh, we encourage you to try out the link, right? Uh, as I say, it's freely available. And uh, if you get the uh, slides, uh, you'll be able to find that. So now I think uh, I and uh, Ian and Yihe would all be happy to take questions. <laughs>